In the name of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, amen. Dear friends in Christ, finally, finally, Psalm 24 has come true. David wrote these words centuries before Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And for centuries, the church sang these words. For centuries, they asked the question we asked this morning, who may stand in his holy place? For centuries, they sang as the answer, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, but does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Perhaps some saw effort and striving in those words. We may ascend, they said. We may stand in God's holy place, they declared. When we rid ourselves of all impurity, when we make ourselves clean and pure and holy, no more false idols, no more false swearing, God does seem to be laying out some parameters here, doesn't he? Clean hands, pure heart, no idols, no false swearing. But who can do this? Who indeed? If we come to the conclusion that we have done this, then we're in trouble. Trouble beyond measure, trouble beyond words. Are my hands clean? Are yours? Is my heart pure? It's yours. Because that's what's required to stand in God's presence. That's what's required to be on God's holy hill, to stand before God. And the Lord spoke to Moses about that and said, No one, no one can see me and live. No one can stand before me. And it's not because God is some Howard Hughes-like misanthrope playing a clever game of how not to be seen. God can't be seen. God can't be survived because he is the light of lights. He is the holy of holies. He is. We can't even grasp that concept. We can barely get our minds around the word is in day-to-day language. That God is from everlasting. That when there was nothing, God is. That God spoke Nothing into something. That God created light without a light source. And that he founded and he established and he owns. You know, it isn't just that we can't bear his presence. It isn't just that the heat is too much. He is too much. Too good. Too great. Too much. Too God. What would or could we say to this God that doesn't sound silly or foolish or puerile? What can we or should we get or give to a God who already has everything? The earth is the Lord's. And yet we go on. We go on making our efforts. We go on making our excuses. We go on explaining how it is that we could stand in God's holy place. Or explain why God's place isn't all that holy. You know, God hates the sin but loves the sinner, we say. He couldn't dare be such an exclusive God as to do anything but. That'd be a bad business model, we say. Except God says, I hate all who do wrong. Not just I hate wrong, I hate those who do wrong. Well, we say, let me make it up to you, God. Let me make it up to you with this nice offer, this nice package, this nice gift. How do you like that? And so we bring to God our offerings, and we say, look, how nice, right? And we bring to God our faithfulness, and we say, look, how good, right? And we bring to God our prayers, and we say, look, how strenuous, right? And we bring to God any number of things, and we say, look, how glorious, right? Now credit me, Lord, credit me. And he says, clean hands, 
pure heart. No idols. And we just can't understand it. We just fail to see what the big deal is. The big deal is anything except clean, pure, and holy offends. And ironically, you understand this completely. You know the honest of cleaning and cleaning and cleaning, and when people arrive, you find that stain that evaded your cleaning. You know the frustration of reading and proofreading, only to find all those piddly little mistakes as you're handing out the final copy. You know the embarrassment, maybe you felt it this morning, of practicing and practicing and practicing and still missing the right notes, still misspeaking. It offends. It hurts. It embarrasses. It shames. It does not give glory. It does not bring glory. It drags down. And that is exactly the definition of blasphemy. Blasphemy isn't simply saying, I am God. Blasphemy is bringing God down to my level. Lowering God. Speaking poorly of God. Speaking scandalously of God. Slandering God. Speaking of God without reverence. Showing contempt with our words or our actions. Dragging God down to my level. And you know what my level is. My level is tit for tat. Well, if I do this, God has to do that. My level is the lowest common denominator. Well, we can't possibly do all these things, but we can do that, and so God's going to have to be happy with that. My level is to make him come to me. Like it or lump it, Lord. It's the way it is. But each of these things does something dreadful. Each one of these things hides God's glory and benefits. Each one of these things does harm to Christ's merits. Each one of these things clouds over Christ's glory and his passion. Each one of these things diverts us and robs us of a sure and firm consolation for our consciences by dragging us down, by taking the glory from God and making it our own, by assigning to ourselves the glory, by making our faces shine as God made Moses' face shine with the radiance of his glory. That's what we talk about on Palm Sunday, isn't it? Glory. Who is this king of glory we just sang? And as I said, we make a mistake when we then take those middle verses of this psalm and apply them to ourselves. Who may ascend his holy hill? Who may stand in his place? Well, clean hands, pure heart, etc., and so on and so forth. The problem is either we come to the conclusion that we do have those clean hands and that pure heart, or we come to the other conclusion that we don't and we can't possibly ever, we can never be in God's presence and God hates us. And in both cases, we have a problem. When we read those verses and insert ourselves into them, we miss something enormous. And we miss the fact that David answers the question for us. Immediately upon asking us, who can ascend? Who can go? Who can stand? David tells us who. Lift up your heads, O your gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Now, finally, we see the one who can ascend God's holy hill. We see the one who can stand in God's holy place. We see the one who can stand in the presence of God. King of glory. The Lord strong and mighty. And up until this point, up until this day, we haven't been able to be sure that that's Jesus. Oh, we've had hints of it. Glimpses, possibilities, potentials. The sick get healed. The deaf hear. The mute speak. The blind see. The demons flee. The water turns to wine. Even the dead rise. And yet, despite all that, even John the Baptist waffled, right? 
Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? But now. Now our king comes. Our king comes righteous and having salvation, Zechariah says. Our king comes. He comes, and as Zechariah goes on to say in his prophecy, he makes us prisoners of hope. Prisoners of hope. Yes, prisoners, trapped, bound, locked into this. Because we see our king come. We see him surrounded by the crowds. We see him surrounded with glory. And then we see him do something so counterintuitive. John tells us on Palm Sunday, he greeted the crowds and then he hid from them. He hid from them because he knew men. He knew their hearts. He entered Jerusalem to all this acclaim. They shouted for him, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is our coming king. Blessed is the son of David. And it looks so grand. It looks so glorious. It looks so honorable. It looks so finally. But prisoners of hope do not function based on what they see. They function based on what God says. And God says through his apostle John that Jesus had to hide from these people. He had to hide from them because they still would not believe in him. He showed them God's arm. He laid bare God's arm, just as the prophet Isaiah said in his 52nd chapter, and still their eyes were blind and their ears wouldn't hear. He said it to them in so many words on Palm Sunday. When someone looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. And of course we ask, really? Yes, really. The Apostle Paul told us that this morning. Though being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. And so fully did he make himself nothing that he submits to death, the lowest place, the deepest place, the darkest place, my place, with my sins, for me, the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, riding in pomp to die. And he became obedient to death, even death on a cross, Paul says. Because now it's time. For years, Jesus has been saying, it's not my time. It's not my time yet. But now today, he says, it's time. On Palm Sunday, he announces it now. Now is the time. Now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Glorified, lifted up, raised up, exalted, made high, given high status, high rank, high honor. But not how you think. Because he spoke to these people on Palm Sunday and he said to them, But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And John tells us what Jesus meant when he said that. He said this to show the kind of death he would die. Just as he had spoken earlier to Nicodemus, right? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Lifted up. Glorified. The king of glory, Jesus, came for this moment, for this purpose, for this reason, for this glory. For the glory of the passion of the Christ. And now we see the king of glory. And he is the king of glory, not because of the crowds that surround him, not because of the acclaim that they give him, not because of his popularity. We saw fall so quickly into that trap of glory ourselves too. Glory for God. Glory for ourselves. We desire comfort. We desire acclaim. We desire popularity. And not just for ourselves. For God too, we say. But God doesn't talk about that. God speaks only about the cross. 
his cross, the cross he bore for us, and then our cross, the cross we bear as we serve him. So we see this King of glory. And we see him all the more brilliantly, our Lutheran confessions teach us, when we teach that we make the most of him as our mediator and atoning sacrifice. Because here and only here do we find our firm consolation. Here and only here do we find our clean conscience. Here and only here do we hear God's response to our cry of Hosanna, save us. And it comes not from my clean hands and pure heart. It comes from his. It comes not from my faithful words and worship. It comes from his. This glory belongs to Christ alone because he alone fulfilled the law of God for us. He alone became obedient to death, even death on the cross, so that then Paul could say, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Now, Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified. And then he speaks of destroying the devil. He speaks of drawing all men to himself when he is lifted up on the cross so that we can sing the words of that blessed hymn we'll sing on Good Friday. My eyes will then behold you. Upon your cross will dwell. My heart will then enfold you. Who dies in faith dies well. Because the King of glory has come. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Jesus the Christ, God's picked and anointed champion. He entered his glory as he took upon himself this suffering on your behalf. And he entered even more glory still as he walked out of the tomb filled with that glory. The glory in which he went back up into heaven. The glory with which he will return. The glory with which he will fill your bodies when he raises you at the last with a body like his glorious resurrected body. And he promises you also that you have this glory now already because he dresses you in this glory in the lowly dress of baptism. And he speaks this glory upon you in the lowly sounding promises of his word. And he gives you this lowly looking glory of his body and blood masked by the bread and wine. But in all these things, he says, lift up your heads. Lift them up. Rejoice. Rejoice. Because your king comes. He comes righteous and having salvation, just as he did on Palm Sunday. He comes with his holy, precious blood. He comes with his innocent suffering and death. He comes and now we can sing. Now we can sing into eternity with all the saints and angels, all the archangels and hosts of heaven. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God. And to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.